Hey, welcome to the Seek Truth Podcast. Alongside Mike Evans, I am Mark Schler. And um, week one in the books, we're looking forward to week two, Mike. So much stuff going on, so much news. Just appreciate you guys being a part of it. Mark Schler alongside Mike Evans. How are you, buddy? Hmm. You notice the quizzical look on my face. Yeah. Hmm. yeah. Something, go, something gonna... seems different with you today. Okay. What is it? So here's the deal. Hmm. I'm just going to go ahead and I'm just going to go ahead and come straight out with it. I dye my beard. <laughs> okay. I'm you're just so, going to go ahead. Now, you're so <clears throat> vain. You're so vain. Here's the deal. Here's the deal. My beard is completely white, but my hair, I don't put any dye in my hair. My hair is what it is. And so my beard was always white, and people would ask me, well, if you dye your hair, why don't you take the time to dye your beard? And I'd be like, I don't dye my hair. That's So finally, my wife, this is like two years ago. You, it's been the first time you've noticed in two years <laughs> that I put a little dye in my beard once a week, right? Just to keep it, it's still salt and pepper, but just to get a little, because otherwise it's completely white, Mike. And so uh, this morning at four o'clock in the morning, I'm like, oh, I got to throw a little dye into my beard. So I throw a little bit of dye and I put a little bit of my mustache. Now my mustache, I don't do like really do it because it's pretty brown. It's, it's got some white stragglers. So I put a little my, in my mustache and I don't, I must've lost track of time because normally I just keep it in for like a minute and a half or so, you know, just enough to, just to keep it like kind of salt and pepper. And so I get in the shower and I'm scrubbing away and, Da, 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 da. And I get out of the shower, I drive, I look, and I'm like, oh, shoot. <laughs> <laughs> and I'll give you, I'll give you credit. You, you rent space in my dome. Um, <laughs> the first thing I thought about is, oh, shoot, heaven's going to kill me. He's going to kill because it's dark. It was really, this part right here is really dark. And so nobody at work said, nobody at Fox said anything. Nobody noticed at Fox, but... I noticed, and of course, as soon as I got on the radio today, like I could see your little devious mind, you're like giggling over there. I'm like, oh shoot, oh, he like, knows. He I knows exactly. Did I not preempt You, did. The, you I, did. I came right out and just went ahead and poured out my soul, like, because I knew that's what you were snickering about <laughs> before you even said anything. So we know each other so well. I know awesome. you, you got me, but All I right. just want everybody to know out there uh, just for men, this space right here is for rent. If that's you right. guys would like to pay me to do this, then um, we're in. Let's let's talk about sponsorship. Let's go, guys. I love it. I love it. <laughs> the, the, the Stinking Truth podcast presented by Just for Men. Yes. <laughs> so there you go. Um, all right, a lot to get to. We got games to talk about. I know you've been talking about some of these games on uh, FS1 Breakfast Ball Show, 6 to 8 to 10 Eastern yeah, time. 6 to 8 your time, yep. Denver time, but uh, 8 to 10 Eastern. 8 to 10 Eastern. I, I, I thought it was interesting. Aaron Rodgers coming out and uh, telling Jet fan, hey, you know, if you're off the bandwagon after one week, fine, but don't be looking to jump on later. Classic, yeah. Aaron. Classic. Yeah, but just such a faulty take, right? I don't know. Don't piss down your legs, right? What, like, if you're going to piss down your legs, are you not allowed to wash your uniform? <laughs> like, okay, well, I'll tell you what. If you promise me not to wash that your uniform every time you piss down your leg, then I'll promise not to jump back on the bandwagon if you guys start playing well. But it, it really wasn't even the issue, Mike. It, you know, it's one thing to go and lose on the road to a really good football team in San Francisco. Like, that happens. Everybody gets that. But you didn't lose on the road. You got your ass kicked on the road, and you gave up eight straight scoring drives. Now, <laughs> going into the season, we would give you – as, as Jets fans, we would give you some leeway offensively. Mike Williams had the ACL. He's coming off of that. He's not 100%. You know, Aaron Rodgers coming off the Achilles. He's not 100%. Or he's 100%, but he hasn't played in a while. You know, you're trying to figure out who my guy is. And obviously, Garrett Wilson became your guy. You know, you guys have a great connection. But you had an offensive line that had issues. You addressed those issues in free agency. Like, there's a lot of different moving parts going on. We'll give that to you offensively. Like, we'll give you time. But we were supposed to hang our hat, boom, on this defense. This defense was supposed to be otherworldly. This defense was supposed to be the best defense in football. This defense was supposed to dominate. This defense was supposed to be top-notch, the number one defense in football. 
and they absolutely got, I mean, run over, run through. A backup running back in Jordan Mason came out and knocked you guys around for 147 yards and a TD. You got your asses kicked. And it was between the tackles. You know that you know that Mason averaged almost six and a half yards per carry mm-hmm. inside between the tackles. Like you guys got run through. And obviously, when when that's happened, dude, you you've got no ability to rush the passer. You know, and they've had this hard stance with Hassan Reddick. Like we're not. You said you would play for what we you know what we traded you for. We're not making any adjustments to your contract. We're not giving you a new contract. And, you know, now not only can you not stop the run, well, you certainly didn't really have any opportunities to rush the passer. So maybe I'll give you a hall pass on that. But let's face it. You went into San Francisco and Robert Sala was a defensive coordinator for Kyle Shanahan. I think in that first Super Bowl run in 2019, he was the defensive coordinator in, in San Francisco. So theoretically, there's nobody should, that should understand that run game and that offense better than you. You practiced against it all the time. And you guys flat out got your asses kicked. Asses kicked. And so, you know, I mean, it, you get off the bandwagon, don't get back on. I, I tell you what, I, I, like, win a couple of football games. And then, we'll, like, we're not on the don't, – don't, hey, don't flatter yourself, Aaron. We were never on the bandwagon. You got approved to us well, as a fan base. Well, wait a minute. <laughs> Wait well, a minute! All off the Jets were all off season. You you've been picking the Jets to win the AFC East. You've been on the bandwagon. I know. I still am on the bandwagon. Okay. Well, are you? May, I am. Listen, hey. I I reserve the right to jump on and off the bandwagon. Okay. Based upon the information that's presented to me. Okay. So the information right now was not good. Like, I use it as motivation for the Jets. I, I kind of punish them almost. Like, I'm going to let you guys know that right now I'm off the bandwagon. Now, when you guys start playing like a football team, you know, old Stink will come back on the bandwagon. You, you could drop the classic dad line and just say, Jets, I'm disappointed in you. I'm just Not mad. I'm not even mad. No. Just, just disappointed. I thought you would go there and at least compete. Right. And you didn't. Right. And that's. Well, that's we'll, hurtful. We'll see if the Jets bounce back uh, in our money making picks, which we'll do a little bit later on in this uh, in this podcast. Let, let's let's jump around a little bit. The Packers life without Jordan Love, at least for the time being, can they survive? I know. Well, how many weeks is he out right now? They've got here's their schedule. They've got in the next four weeks. They've got Indianapolis. They've got Tennessee. Then they've got um, Minnesota. And then they play um, – oh, shoot, they play somebody that's good after that. Um, so, I think in the next three weeks, could they survive that? They could probably survive that. But here's the, here's the value of having a veteran backup quarterback that can operate your system and isn't going to leave you hanging. They, they went out and got Malik Willis, and they got him like August 22nd or 23rd or 4th or something like that. So not only do you get a guy that has not proven that he can have success in this league, but you got a guy that just has been there for a couple of weeks. And you've got a weaker stretch of your schedule, but, you know, how long is Jordan Love going to be out? And they said, hey, listen, I wouldn't be surprised or it's, you know, fluid or whatever. That dude ain't playing for at least two or three weeks, at least. He's not. You can sit there and, and like, Hey, it's day to day. Like we we believe that he can come back, but you don't really believe that. So yeah, that they've got a problem, Mike. I think they have a real problem because you know. And again, maybe Malik Willis comes out and plays really well, but come on, dude, that guy has not been a legitimate quarterback since he's been drafted. They go Colts at home, at Titans, home against the Vikings, at the Rams. And then home against the Cardinals during this stretch, uh, where you think that uh, Jordan Love uh, might be out. So we'll see if they're able to uh, hang in there. They get the Colts this week. Uh, level of concern with Cincinnati right now. Is it is it real concern, or is it just hey, this is what happens with the Bengals and Joe Burrow? I think you guys have been flashing the stat on your show. What one in nine? One in nine. One in nine in weeks one and two. Yeah, over in the last his couple of years. Yeah. 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 It you know, 
I think there's a real level of concern. First off, they, they asked Joe Burrow about his wrist. And if you saw him, you know, he's in the game doing this and, you know, on the sideline, he's in the huddle. He's like, dude, there's something wrong with your wrist, right? Something's bothering you. Yeah. And as you know, I mean, I did take credit for a lot of his success success because I did pray for his tiny little hands. <laughs> he's got did. little little itty bitty hands. They're like, <laughs> if you put my hand up here and his hand is like that. <laughs> so tiny little hands. But <clears throat> when you have a wrist injury and you already have smaller hands to begin with, like if you really got to grip it and rip it, like do you have that ability? And you listen, these are always issues with quarterbacks. Obviously, when it's your throwing hand and, and it's throwing mechanics and how do you change your mechanics and how does it affect your accuracy and all these things when you have an injury there. But I would tell you, you know, there are guys, he's never been an elite level arm talent guy, which, you know me, I don't care about arm talent until all of a sudden I care about it. Like, I normally don't care about arm talent, but if you're not an elite level arm talent guy and you get injured and it affects your ability to throw the ball, and you don't have extra arm talent to overcome it? Could it be a Chad Pennington situation? Could it be a, mm -hmm. you know, a Peyton Manning toward the end of his career situation with the neck injury? Like, I, you worry about those things. And then, you know, I think they'll be better. I think, obviously, um, Jamar Chase um, held in, didn't practice all training camp, played last week, probably had a limited menu of what the plays he could, you know, run and all that kind of stuff. So he should be better in this second week. But – Again, like they gave up a bunch of pressures. I think they gave up three sacks. They don't run the ball with, with, with any efficiency at all. Um, oftentimes they don't try. T. Higgins was, was injured. You know, they no longer have Boyd. Like they've lost weapons and they've lost weapons in, in a time where Joe Burrow's got to elevate the franchise and elevate the receivers and the people around him. Now all of a sudden his wrist is bothering him again. And he was, you know, he had surgery on it last year and missed – however many times, however much of the end of the season he missed. Is it a concern? Yeah, damn right it's a concern. They play the uh, Chiefs, and I, I was playing some golf the other day with a Chiefs <laughs> fan, and he said, he said, Mike, uh, your people here in Denver especially aren't going to like to hear this, but I guess it applies for the rest of the NFL. He insists the Chiefs are better than they were last year. That if you wanted to get the Chiefs, you needed to get them last year because they're actually better this year. Tell me that's not the case. No, I think that's definitely the case. Ugh. I think well, another year defensively in that system with Spags, and Spags is as good as it gets when it comes to game planning and creating a, you know, creating a plan and taking your best players out of the game and all that stuff. He is great. Now, they lost um, one of their starting corners. He was arguably one of the best players uh in you know at his position so they they lost uh what is it legerious sneed i think was that the guy they lost that that left but um still yep. defensively they're really really good um offensively listen patrick mahomes has more weapons now xavier worthy can really want run we saw him in you know in week one not only the reverse for the touchdown but the busted coverage down the sideline where they got him in the uh, proverbial turkey hole um, for another touchdown there. Um, and then, you know, they didn't even have Hollywood Brown week one. And because Rasheed Rice is not suspended, you know, he's going to be the go-to guy. And it looks, uh, for all intents and purposes, it looks like Rasheed Rice is not going to be punished until next year, next offseason. So, yeah, I think offensively, I think you know, what, where they struggled last year in the first, I think at one point they were nine and six. Where they struggled last year was on the offensive side of the ball. I think they're much better offensively than they were a year ago. And defensively, I don't think they have slumped off at all. Great. Awesome. Right. NFL is so happy to hear, hear about that. The Eagles, there was a, a legitimate sense of panic with the way the Eagles finished last season and, and, and a lot of concern about how they were going to pick up this season. Would there be a hangover? after what happened last season. That performance against against Green Bay and Brazil, in, in your mind, does that go a long way towards sort of, you know, subduing, quelling some of that panic? No, I, don't, no? I mean, I don't think so. I think there's a couple of things. Like, last year, Jalen Hurts um, had 15 interceptions. 
in his last, I think, in his last six games, he had five interceptions and one fumble lost, I believe. So, like, he had a turnover issue. And then in that game against Green Bay, he threw two picks. But it's not even the two picks that concern me, Mike. It's where you threw the two picks. So, as a player, you know, you've got to be able to win, especially as you age in football, from the neck up. You've got to be smart enough to understand, you know, where your issues are. So, one of the things I would always talk to myself about as I was game planning, you know, to, to stop somebody is kind of where my help is and, and how do I use it. So, for instance, if I had a defensive tackle on, on my, you know, my outside shoulder, right, and I knew I had on my inside shoulder, I knew I had a running back that was going to release through the A-gap after he checked his blitz responsibilities. So the odds are I was going to have late protection right here on my inside shoulder. So my thought process was, where can I not get beat? Well, I can't get beat to my upfield shoulder. So I'm going to actually overset this guy a little bit, make sure I take away any upfield outside move to this shoulder and invite him to win late back on the inside where all of a sudden what happens? He wins late. I've got, you know, he's on my edge a little bit, but what happens? All of a sudden the running back comes through that hole and I know that's his responsibility. So I know where I can get beat. I know where I can't get beat and I stop you from beating me there. And I know where I can get beat late because I'll have help there eventually. And so you've got to think about the game that way. Jalen Hurts, two interceptions. Third down and 15 coming off his own goal line. They run this, they run what they call a buck cover two. So you have two high safeties in the middle of the field. The middle linebacker is running with number three. So that it, the, if you take it from outside in, one, two, three, that's how you label receivers, right? So he's running with number three, and he's stride for stride. And Jalen Hurts on third down 15. Now they're playing the sticks, so the defense is way back. You've got Gall- Dallas Gardner on a, on a check down. He's probably not going to get a first down, Mike. But he's going to get you off the goal line, give you some room to punt. It's like It would be the best decision. He's wide open. They're not covering him. So you check it down. He's probably going to get 12 yards of the 15. You're still mm-hmm. going to have to punt, but it takes you off the goal line. Right. What does Jalen Hurts do? Throws it right down the middle where essentially that number three wide receiver, that number three receiver – is triple covered and the result a pick and what happens instead of punting and letting your defense play you're giving up points because they return it down to about the 10 yard line you're giving up at least a field goal or 15 yard line you're going to give up a field goal probably going to give up a touchdown and then later in the game it's third down and 13 you're in the red zone and again they're playing off to make you throw it underneath and again what happens You've got three points in your bag, yep. right? you got three points in your bag, but what do you do? You force one to a receiver. Jair Alexander peels off of his coverage and just jumped in front and picked it off. And so now you've not only given up, and I think they scored a touchdown, Green Bay did, but you've not only given up seven, but you took three off the board at the same time. So, you know, that's, that's, ten, <clears throat> that's 10 points of absolute shit decisions. Two plays, they cost you 10 points. I think it was, I don't quote me. I think it it was at least six, but you, you get the point is that they're giving up those, they're giving up those points. It's throwing a pick is not necessarily the worst thing in the world that happens to you, but throwing a pick in those two situations is just bad football. And that's what concerns me about the decision-making process that Jalen Hurts has been going through since, you know, uh, the last the last six games, seven games last year, six games in a playoff game, and then the first game this year. I While well, we're talking about quarterbacks and, and decision-making, things that you say, um, things that you choose to say, how about Kyler Murray this week coming out and saying it's not his job to look for Marvin Harrison Jr., not his right. job to try to He's, force the ball to, right. to Marvin Harrison Jr.? Yeah, I think that the point is, it's not his job to force the ball to Marvin Harrison Jr. He's 100% correct. 100% correct. Like, one, the ball goes 
the ball goes to where the dictate the, the coverage dictates it to go. So when you're running a concept, right? In in any concept you run, there's somebody you're putting in you somebody you're putting in conflict. So if you're getting, let's say you're getting just call it quarters coverage, like you're getting your outside cornerback has a deep quarter and your safety has the other deep quarter, right? So um, you know, I coach a little league team with Peyton Manning. This is called Pittsburgh, Pittsburgh. So what you're running in Pittsburgh is you're running on the outside of post and on the inside and in cutting route. And what you're doing is you run that in cutting route right in front of the eyes of the safety to grab the safety. And then you're throwing the post behind it and it's wide open because the corner has outside leverage on the wide receiver. And so that's a post in what she calls Pittsburgh. So bottom line is that you're going where the, the coverage dictates. So if all of a sudden that safety decides, I'm going to play deep and take away the post, well, then you're just going to throw the in route because it's going to be uncovered. So that's the guy you're putting in conflict. You're making the safety on that particular route combination, it's a two-man route combination, you're making him make a decision. And if he decides to play the, the in route, you throw the post. If he decides to play the post route, you throw the in. And so it isn't Kyler Murray's job to force the ball to Marvin Harrison Jr. But I will say this. At some point, you've got to develop, you know, a rapport with your guy that says, hey, man, if we get into nut cutting time, right, third down and seven, I need to play. Even if you're double covered, to me, you're uncovered. I'm throwing it to you. Go up and make a play. But that's going to take time. Well, yeah, that was that was going to be my point. I mean, Marvin Harrison was the fourth overall pick. This is a guy that many people say give him the gold jacket already because that's how good this guy is. So the idea that you, you go to whoever is the open guy, I, I, I guess I would come back and say, hey, Marvin Harrison, if he's all that, if he's a true superstar right from the beginning, play above the X's and O's, if he's out on the field, he's open. Right. Throw it up there. Right. Let him go make well, a play. But then, then you start saying, then you have to start saying as a coordinator, like mentally, what can he handle? Because if you just line up at X, for instance, you're just the X receiver and we're running, you know, a bunch of X individual routes. So we're got X go, X comeback, X, X stutter, X, whatever. Um, it's really easy to double team that, right? It's really easy to jam the corner, have the corner play trail and get a safety over the top and it automatically kind of takes that route combination away. So now, like Justin Jefferson, what do we do with Justin Jefferson? Well, sometimes he's at X, sometimes he's at F, sometimes he's at Z. We're going to motion him into stacks. We're going to move him around a bunch. Well, that takes a lot to be in the right place, to make sure you're doing the right thing. And I'm sure Marvin Harrison has that capability, but is he ready to do all that stuff yet? I don't know. So <laughs> there's – there's an aspect of this that it's a work in progress and I'm just going to put my faith that they'll figure it out and he'll figure it out. But, um, I think Kyler Murray, you, most of the time I'll go like, you know, I mean, I'll hold him accountable when he needs to be held accountable, but I think he's hundred percent right. It's not his job to force it. It's his job. And obviously you're trying, it's a coach's job to put him in a position to be open. It's a coach's job to put him in a scheme or a, you know, a combination where he's going to get an opportunity. Um, and, and so those are the things I think you have to look at. But I think Dorch got eight, like eight targets, and Marvin Harrison Jr. got three targets, I think, or four tar three targets, I think. Let's ask about uh, – talk about the game that you've got this week, Washington and the Giants. Now, I mean, on the surface, it's, it's not that great of a football matchup, but we're talking about two, you know, powerhouse programs. You're going <laughs> to have a huge audience uh, watching – this game, you know, two two teams that you know very well played for Washington. All your time spent in the NFC East, you've been studying the film all week, looking at these two teams. Uh, which which one played in a way in Week One that gives you maybe hope that there's brighter days ahead for that team? I would say I would say Washington. Um, you know, I, I don't necessarily agree with Cliff Kingsbury's offensive approach which is line up and shotgun 96 percent of the time and you know there was not one under center pass 
in that game. And you know I pay attention to crap like that, right? <laughs> yes. Um, crap because, like that. Okay. Right. Yes. Well, because why is that important, Mike? <laughs> why why is why is lying up under center important? Go ahead. Uh, all right. So one, it opens up your run game. At a shotgun, the menu you have to run the ball shrinks by 30 or 40 percent. So it opens up the run game. Two, when you run it out of shotgun, you have a much better operation when it comes to the run action, play action stuff. So it looks like run. Yep. So when you're taking the ball from our center and turning your back to the defense and flagging that ball out there, you know what they do? They lose sight of the football. Where's it at? Because you got to look through the defensive line. If you're a linebacker or safety, you got to look through the defensive line, through the offensive line, and and you know, and then you get to the quarterback and running back. But that quarterback is hunched down. He's handing that ball off or faking that hand off. That running back is taking it slow. It's much more deceptive. If you're in shotgun or pistol, you turn around, everybody sees you, you're standing straight up. So it's a different dynamic. So there's less deception. Think about like a big think about a big league pitcher. If every time you throw a fastball, it's from here, but when you throw your curveball, it's from down here or so, and then if, if every time you throw a pitch, it's from a different arm angle, right. you know where the hitters are gonna go? Oh, here comes the fastball. Mm -hmm. Oh, here comes the curve. Oh, here comes the changeup. Right. And so when you're handing the ball off or faking a handoff from shotgun or pistol, it's like changing your arm mechanic for a pitcher. It, those guys don't bite. They get their depth. And so there's a reason I hate that. I hate that. I hate the whole system. And then the other thing about Jaden Daniels, I think he had 16 rushing attempts and he probably had, as I go back to, through my mind, he probably had eight scrambles out of the pocket, eight or nine scrambles and the rest were designed run plays. Um, he probably missed of those eight scrambles, at least four opportunities to throw the ball mm -hmm. because he just decided to take off. And wide open receivers, one of them could have been a big time to Luke McCaffrey, could have been a big time seam route that was, they didn't cover him, wide open. But he'd already <laughs> predetermined he's going to run. And then they had a second down and eight, and they had a little – mirror combination of two guys running hooks on the inside and two guys running outs on the outside. And the side that he was looking at, the out, the, the cornerback on that side had nine yards of depth. It was second down and eight. And he's backing up. And that ball is wide open. The receiver catches it. You put it on him. He's going to turn and, and he'll get a first down. And instead, uh, you scrambled and you got a first down, scrambling. But <clears throat> that's the kind of stuff that will cost you games eventually. Last question. This is one that everybody who is a Giants fan is asking. Is Daniel Jones salvageable? No. Mm. I mean, like, I always say this about San Francisco. San Francisco brought Sam Darnold in last year. Say, hey, we're going to give you a, a chance to rehab. And, um, you know, and, and to learn the system. You're not beating out Purdy, but you can beat out Trey Lance. He comes in there on his, what, fourth team, and it's apparent right off the bat. He's way better than Trey Lance. And what do the Niners do? Remember, they moved from 12 to 3 to get Trey Lance. They gave him three first-round choices, right? He's only, what, a couple of years into his career. What do they do? They gave him a competition with a guy that's coming off the scrap heap that guy beats him out, and they dump him to Dallas. Like, sometimes, Mike, you have to just understand that you got to rip the Band-Aid off. Sometimes you just have to understand, man, we screwed up. Daniel Jones has more interceptions for touchdowns since he signed that $160 million contract than he has touchdown passes. Mm -hmm. um, and, I, you know, I looked at the, I looked at the film – He's making the same mistakes he made as a rookie. 
like you want to talk about staring down receivers and you know call i call it with him he's got that giant helmet he's got that red stripe he's just red striping guys so all of a sudden he wants to throw at this guy all right he's watching the whole time and you'll see guys from the other side of the football field like hell bent for election just break and they're breaking before he even throws it and interceptions or knockdown passes there is like it's 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 the same thing he did as a rookie his second year his third year his fourth year his fifth year and now in his sixth year and so at what time is he going to figure it out when is he going to at what point are you going to salvage i i just i think you know they thought oh well another big time receiver you know we got went out and got malik neighbors that's going to fix it no it's not I mean, you can get you can get, you can get stretch freaking Armstrong to pay play receiver for them. It's not going to fix him. Deep pull there. Look that up, kids. Look that up. Great toy, <laughs> Matt. Great you know what? You know what, Matt? All right. Well, Matt knows it over there, and he's a he's a youngin. He's got it. He knows stretch <laughs> Armstrong. There you go. Hey, it's time for our money maker picks. Last week, uh, you went a very boring one, one and one. You always get that early tie. That I early, do. I do that have early that. push. You always get an early push, which it makes it interesting for the as the season plays out because we always have to factor in that push into the mm-hmm. standings, right? So um, I went two and one. I get to go first this week. So uh, here you go. Here are my picks. I'm going to take Houston minus six and a half over Chicago. Uh, Chicago got the win last week. Uh, Caleb Williams did did not play that well. Mm. Now they got to go on the road. Houston looks like a a, a budding, you know, real power in the yeah. AFC. So give me Houston minus the points. I'll lay them. I'm going to take the Jets to bounce back. Hop back on that Jets bandwagon. I'm going to take the Jets minus three and a half uh, against the Titans on the road. And I think Joe Burrow's week one and week two struggles continue. The uh, Chiefs very comfortable coming off the mini bye after playing the previous Thursday. I'll lay the six uh, with the Chiefs. All right, I like it. I like it. I'm going to go the. Uh, I'm going to go to the Saints. Saints getting six and a half against the Cowboys. Yeah. I did the Saints game. Yeah. Now Carolina is not quite ready for. Uh, Forget about prime time. They're not ready for, you know, the matinee. They like they're they're not ready to play. But <laughs> I think the Saints are pretty damn good at the control line of scrimmage. I think this new offensive system under Clint Kubiak is really good for Derek Carr, really good for Alvin Kamara. So I'm going with the Saints. I'm getting the six and a half. I'll take them. Um, San Francisco plays Minnesota. Really neat return for Sam Darnold. But who knows Sam Darnold better? Then Kyle Shanahan and the guys who practiced against him all last year in San Francisco. San Francisco looked like a powerhouse, a juggernaut. I like the San Francisco given the five and a half. So I'll take the, the uh, Niners there. And then the Chargers. Um, this is going to be a theme for me. So <laughs> Dibsy. I got Dibsy. You got Dibs? Um, I got Dibs on this. Chargers minus six over Carolina. I will always pick every week from this point forward against Carolina, regardless <laughs> of the point spread. Uh, I think I've, I've, I've dibs that. That is my thing. So I'm taking the Chargers, and I'm giving the six. All right. Sounds good. Have a great call this weekend with the Giants and uh, Redskins, or excuse me, Commanders, and um, we'll talk about it all next week. Sounds good, buddy. Thank you so much for watching the Stinking Truth Podcast. We appreciate you guys. From Mike, I am Mark. Make sure you uh, – Give us a like uh, and also uh, subscribe. Thank you so much. We'll be back with you guys uh, early next week.